On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. In this episode of Miracles of Nature, we will travel to the Holy Land, Israel. We will start in the south and work our way to the north. Along the way, we will stop to admire several locations. Some of the stops will take us to incredible works of nature, while others are the setting of biblical tales. We will also present places that are associated with historical turning points. We begin today's episode in the picturesque desert oasis of Ein Gedi, where King David found his refuge. In the north of Israel, we will climb the Golan Heights, whose natural beauty, sadly, is overshadowed by the ongoing conflict. We will conclude our Holy Land pilgrimage on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, tracing the footsteps of Jesus. Welcome to Southern Israel. For millennia, this hostile environment attracted prophets and escapees alike, from King David and John the Baptist to Jesus Christ. Even though the landscape of Southern Israel comes across as hostile, it isn't quite as it seems. This is more than just a place of strong religious tradition and more than the setting of many biblical tales. Over centuries, people sought spiritual enlightenment and also struggled to find a way to survive in such harsh conditions. One of the few spots that truly welcomes life has always been the Ein Gedi Oasis. A verse from Solomon's Song of Songs helps to date the Ein Gedi Oasis. My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor in the vineyards of Ein Gedi. Looking at these pictures, one could believe that the Garden of Eden was located here. The holy text, however, places an entirely different story into the setting of Ein Gedi. David apparently came here to hide from King Saul. David spotted the king walking in the surrounding caves. Though David could have easily surprised and killed him, he chose instead to cut off a sliver of King Saul's cape, which went unnoticed. It is difficult to consider the Bible as an historically accurate source. Archaeological findings indicate that people lived here as far back as 5,000 years. The Nubian Ibex has inhabited the Ein Gedi since biblical times. These elegant, sure-footed, and incredibly agile animals roam the steep slopes with ease. The oasis is named after them. The name Ein Gedi is composed of two Hebrew words. Ein means spring, and Gedi means goat kid. Ein Gedi thus means spring kid. Wild animals and people live together in the oasis in surprising harmony. As a result, it is possible to examine even this unique creature, the Sudanese hyrax, up close. At first glance, it resembles a rodent, but in reality, this is an ungulate. It is genetically closest to the elephant. The monotonous quality of the desert can cause you to forget that tales from the Bible follow you with almost every step you take. Here, for instance, only a few kilometers from Ein Gedi, stood the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. With a little bit of imagination, you can see where that pillar of salt over there could be Lot's wife. Here, salt is a common mineral. This is partially due to the vicinity of the Dead Sea. Records of its unique properties date as far back as the fourth century BCE. Even Aristotle mentions its existence. Its name is Yam HaMalach in Hebrew, meaning the Sea of Salt. The concentration of salt is 10 times that of the ocean. As a result, the human body floats without a single stroke having to be made. It also contains a very high concentration of bromine, magnesium, and iodine. 
One third of the water in the Dead Sea is made up of solid particles. Understandably, no creatures live in it. In the past, people considered it to be a demonic lake. It truly earned the name the Dead Sea. However, in the 20th century, people from around the world started coming here to take advantage of its unique healing properties. The Dead Sea is often considered to be the largest natural spa in the world. The surrounding air provides certain health benefits. Additionally, it is also the lowest point on our planet, lying precisely 417 meters below sea level. As such, the concentration of oxygen in the air is higher than normal. The minerals which continuously evaporate from the water play an important role as well. Bromine, used as an additive in sedatives, has a calming effect. Iodine enhances and improves thyroid gland functionality. Different treatments using Dead Sea mud are also very popular. The constant temperature of the mud gradually affects the body. It helps lessen the pain associated with rheumatism and arthritis. The high concentration of minerals in the mud simultaneously stimulates blood circulation and has the ability to cure certain skin diseases. The mud originates from floods that washed it from the surrounding mountains. It becomes enriched with minerals and plant extracts during erosion. This miracle mud has become an extremely valuable commodity for export and sought after by innumerable cosmetic companies. The crude mud collected on the beaches is purified and worked into a very fine consistency. It is then packaged and shipped to customers seeking relief for a variety of symptoms. The commercialization of substances from the Dead Sea has been ongoing for millennia. Bitumen, used in the mummification process, was collected on the shores of the Dead Sea and sold to ancient Egyptians. But for how long can the Dead Sea withstand such human abuse? This remains an important question. The River Jordan is the principal tributary of the Dead Sea. It is incapable of replacing its evaporating water. The speed at which its sea level is diminishing, about a meter per year, is an ongoing cause for concern. The tourist resort of Ein Bokek is waterless and requires water to be pumped in. The Israeli and Jordanian governments recently joined forces and established a collective project to supply seawater to the Jordan from the Aqaba Bay in the Red Sea. We have moved further south. We are now in the very heart of the Negev Desert. The sun is just rising above the Maktesh Raman crater. In the Book of Psalms it says, How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Whether you look upon the Maktesh Raman crater as the creation of God or a miracle of nature, one thing is certain. It is a masterpiece. From a purely geological perspective, water is the architect of this crater. During floods, the water undermined the riverbeds. It continued to disturb the integrity of the solid rock. Gradually, it sank into the distinctly softer geological layers. Beautiful mesas remain, standing as witnesses to the ruthless work of time. Yet another stunning example of geological effects in the area is the so-called Carpenter's Workshop. This unique rock formation was shaped by geological pressure in such a way that it resembles processed pieces of wood, hence the name. Even though only 50,000 people live there, the Negev Desert constitutes more than half of Israel's territory. At first sight, the Negev Desert comes across as an entirely hostile environment unsuitable for life. On closer inspection, we realize that it can be considered a botanical garden. The local flora consists of 1,500 different plant species, all of which are well adapted to life in desert conditions. They survive on a minimum amount of water. The beautiful flowers of the Sitvanit are no exception. The name of this flower is derived from the Hebrew word for autumn. It blooms at the very end of summer, announcing the onset of a new season. 
The crown of thorns Jesus wore was weaved from its boughs. It was a welcome source of nutrition to the Nabataeans passing through on their trading missions. The Nabataeans were successful merchants. In the third century BCE, they imported spices and other valuable items from India. Their caravans often numbered a thousand camels, each hauling a load of 300 kilos. And so, in today's terms, a single caravan carried goods worth millions of dollars. What you see right here are the remains of the so-called incense route. It wound 2,400 kilometers from Oman to Yemen via Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and the Negev Desert, all the way to the port of Gaza. From there, the goods journeyed over the Mediterranean Sea into Europe. The Nabataeans carefully guarded this route. Only they knew its secrets. At the time, a similar camp was established every 36 kilometer. The ancient merchants stayed overnight in them, gathering needed strength. Here, they treated themselves to well-deserved baths and feasts and were entertained by tempting belly dancers. No wonder the Nabataeans were known at the time as masters of the desert. Their route was precisely mapped and secured. Voluminous cisterns, hidden to passers-by, were erected in the valleys. A continuous water supply was ensured through an ingenious system of canals that brought rainwater from the surrounding hills. The Nabataeans were eventually swept aside from the incense route. The Romans set upon them such high taxes that the trade route became largely unprofitable. The merchants ended their nomadic ways and commenced building cities. The city of Avdat was such a city. By the way, it was right here in the ruins of this 2300-year-old city where the famous musical Jesus Christ Superstar was filmed. Back to the Nabataeans. Because of their trade routes, they acquired knowledge about the cultivation of wine, ceramics, and life in the desert. This made their settlement in the desert easier, as they could produce their own merchandise. They built their homes in the very heart of the Negev Desert, complete with wine and olive terraces. After 2,000 years, the ancient Nabataean gardens are still the daily toil of Israeli farmers. One of the founding fathers of the State of Israel and its first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, envisioned Israelis carrying on this Nabataean tradition. Israeli farmers work them today, and so they not only carry on in the Nabataean traditions, they are a healthy source of commerce. It was Ben-Gurion who decided to go against nature. He saw the best hope for the state of Israel right here in the Negev Desert. He proclaimed, if the state does not stop the desert, the desert will stop the state. As a result, he is also known as the father of the Negev. It is thanks to him that Israel is among the countries with the greatest experience in desert irrigation and the protection of fertile land. We will end our journey through the Holy Land at the grave site of David Ben-Gurion, located in the heart of his beloved Negev, above the Zin Valley in southern Israel. The surrounding hills are not as green as he might have wished, but the heritage of those who decided to take on the hostile nature and managed to make the Negev their home is an inspiring legacy to generations to come. We have reached the northern end of Israel. From the days of the 12 tribes of Israel, people hoped to settle on hills and highlands, believing that would bring them closer to the Lord. Even though the Golan Heights are part of the Holy Land, our interest in this area isn't spiritual in nature. The Golan Heights are of strategic military importance. Until recently, it was the center of Arab-Israeli conflict. The basalt plateau of the Golan Heights was raised by volcanic activity. It stretches from the Sea of Galilee 
all the way to the Lebanese border. In the east, the plateau reaches the capital of Syria, Damascus. It towers over the Israeli, Lebanese, and Syrian territory as a lookout post. It is therefore obvious that the country who controls the Golan Heights also has a military advantage over the surrounding states. At their highest, the Golan Heights rise 2,224 meters above sea level. In the winter months of January through March, up to two meters of snow can fall, turning this war zone into a ski resort. It is nowhere near the sophistication of alpine ski resorts, but Israelis aren't snobbish, since it's the only slope within a radius of 3,000 kilometers. The advantageous position of the Golan Heights has drawn people since pre-biblical times. The 700 dolmens, erected 4,000 years ago by a civilization of ancient nomads, speaks testimony to that fact. Two thousand years later, Jewish rebels made good use of the Golan Heights to fortify the town of Gamla against the Romans. The name Gamla comes from the Hebrew word meaning camel, because the hill we are currently standing on resembles a camel's hump. In the year 66 AD, the Romans attempted to conquer this city surrounded by impenetrable passes. They had to call upon seven legions. Despite their large number of soldiers and their use of catapults, the rebels, barricaded within the city, withstood the onslaught of the Romans for days. In the end, however, the city fell when three Roman soldiers managed to undermine one of the city's towers. Its collapse allowed the fortress to be opened. According to the dramatic description of historian Joseph Flavio, the Romans savagely murdered 4,000 people and the remaining 5,000 committed suicide rather than fall into Roman slavery. The ruins of the local synagogue, the oldest in the world, stands a silent witness of the terrible massacre. The strategic significance of the Golan Heights was once again important during the medieval Crusades. In the 12th century, the Syrians built the imposing fortress of Nimrod. Its main purpose was to guard the route from the Mediterranean Sea to Damascus against the Sixth Crusade. The battles between Muslims and Christians over the dominion of the Holy Land only foreshadowed the cruel conflicts still to come in the 20th century. Shortly after the independent state of Israel was founded, the Syrians started using the strategic advantage of the Golan Heights to bombard the newly established Jewish state. The conflict climaxed when on the 10th of June, 1967, Israel attacked the Syrian positions and occupied the Golan Heights. The so-called Six-Day War claimed thousands of lives but didn't solve the situation. The escalating tension culminated in 1973 with a counterstrike the coalition of the Arab states utilizing Soviet ammunition. The Arabs took the Jews by surprise, crushing them during an important Jewish holiday, Yom Kippur. The so-called Yom Kippur War lasted 12 days. 1.5 million soldiers, over 6,000 tanks, and 2,000 warplanes took part. In the end, the Golan Heights remained under Israeli administration. In 1981, Israel annexed the territory under an authority still in dispute to this day. As we travel the Golan Heights, we see the remains of war dispersed over a wide area. The situation is still far from resolved. Peace along the borders is barely maintained by United Nations troops, and Syria still has a claim to the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights come across as a hostile territory whose only significance is from a military perspective. But that's not their total value. The Golan Heights are also significant because of their abundant water supply. Thanks to their altitude, rainfall is plentiful in the Golan Heights. They are also a source of snowmelt, which makes its way into the local rivers every spring. Overall, 15% of all water in Israel originates right here in the Golan Heights. 
Israeli settlers managed to take advantage of the water supply here. They created an ingenious irrigation system, which in times of drought brings the much needed water to virtually every tree. Besides fruit and vegetables, wine from grapes also thrives here. The local red wine is considered of top quality thanks to the basalt subsoil, high contents of minerals in the earth, and cool winters. The Golan Heights represent a true miracle of nature, a miracle that enables people to survive in the otherwise hostile and dry region of the Middle East. Besides being a life-giving region, it is also a source of conflict and war, where thousands have lost their lives. It could be said that the one who controls the Golan Heights also controls the main life-giving source of water in the whole region. We move from the peaks of the Golan Heights to their foothills. We are now in a place where the River Jordan empties into the Sea of Galilee. The River Jordan originates in the north of the Golan Heights. Its 251 kilometer long river basin, besides being the main source of fresh water for Israel and Jordan, is also the most fertile area in the entire Middle East. It is no wonder that the River Jordan has also become a significant spiritual symbol. The crossing of the River Jordan signifies the return to the promised land for the Jews. For Christians, it is inherently linked to John the Baptist and the tradition of baptism. The entire area where the Jordan River empties into the Sea of Galilee has an important significance to the Christian faith. Jesus Christ settled not far from here in the village of Capernaum. He began to spread the Christian faith from a local synagogue whose remains stand till this day. Thousands of pilgrims from around the world follow the footsteps of Jesus to all the places where he made miracles happen and where he preached Christianity. For example, here on this rock, in a place called Tagba, he fed 5,000 famished people with two fish and five loaves of bread. And here, having been crucified, Jesus revealed himself to his apprentices for the third time, instructing the apostle Peter to take over and look after his followers. The fishermen of today sail out each morning on the Sea of Galilee in pursuit of fish. Sardines are the most common catch, but occasionally a larger fish will be caught the best known as the tilapia. These were caught here as far back as the time of Jesus and so are stylishly referred to as St. Peter's fish. New species of fish, capable of cleaning the water, were introduced in recent years. This is because the Sea of Galilee, fed by the Jordan River, is a primary source of drinking water. Fishermen have fished these waters for generations. Their trade has become increasingly endangered in recent years. Due to the massive usage of its water, the Sea of Galilee is threatened with a similar fate as the Dead Sea. Its level has dropped by three meters in the last year alone, and the situation is now critical. Today's hard labor comes to an end. The fishermen are returning to the shore. May they come back tomorrow and in the upcoming years with a bountiful catch. Today's episode of Miracles of Nature has also come to its end. We traversed the Holy Land from south to north. En route, we visited places of incredible beauty entwined with rich spiritual essence. Some of these places have a cruel past. 
Let's pray then that long-sought peace finally comes to this remarkable land.